Hi everyone. Welcome to another BookPal webinar. We've actually got a new host with us today, Elizabeth, our marketing associate. Hi guys. I'm really excited to be here. And once again, I'm Michelle, the manager of marketing, and today we're talking about productivity. Yay. So here's what we have planned for the next 30 minutes. We're going to do an 18-minute presentation on the science of productivity based on the eight principles introduced in Charles's new book, which is on the screen. Then we're going to dive into a five-minute Q&A session. So if you have questions at any time, go ahead and chat them to us. And at the very end, we will be picking our one lucky winner who's going to receive a copy of this book. So be sure to stick around. And next week, we will have this webinar recording available, and we'll email it to you. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and dive in. So first we wanted to mention a little bit about the author, Charles Duhigg. This is actually his second book. His first book is a New York Times bestseller, The Power of Habit, and it's also a book pal bestseller as well. We've sold thousands of copies to different companies across the country. And in his new book, each chapter covers a productivity concept that's demonstrated by real life examples. So we're gonna go chapter by chapter to cover each point. All right. And the very first chapter is about motivation. So motivation and productivity are actually very closely linked because motivated people tend to earn more money, are happier, and just more generally satisfied with life, their family, and their job. So the key question in this chapter is how do you motivate people? We're just gonna pause for a second to hear what you guys think. So go ahead and type in your chat box what you think is the number one way to motivate someone. And there really are no wrong answers. So just go ahead and type what you think. It will all be anonymous. All right, so some people have said money, perks, flexibility. Great, those are all great answers. And Charles's answer is to actually give people a sense of control. Because when people feel in control, they have, when they feel like they have the ability to make their own decisions, they have this sense of autonomy and self-determination. And I personally experienced this at BookPal when, when I just got to take over the blog because Michelle said to me about a year ago, like, here, like, feel free to do what you own the blog within reason. You can have responsibility over it. So I got really excited about it because, well, I'm a writer, so I enjoy writing blog posts and putting content together and mapping out a calendar. And the sense of responsibility just really motivated me to do a really good job on this. And in the end, it's in about a year, like I said, and we've grown our blog viewership by over 400% and it's been really rewarding and really incredible. And she's done a really great job with it. So if you guys ever have some free time, I would recommend checking it out at blog.book-pal.com. So also on the topic of control, there's two different locuses of control, internal and external. And the internal is kind of, it's when you feel that you are in control of your destiny through, that you can influence it through the choices you make, which is kind of like when you're driving a car, you feel in control. And if you guys attended our mindset webinar a couple months ago, then you might be familiar with this concept. It's similar to a growth mindset. These types of people tend to praise or blame themselves for failures and successes. People with an external locus of control, on the other hand, they believe that their life is primarily influenced by events that are outside of their control, which is similar to the fixed mindset. So it's kind of like being on an airplane where you don't really feel in control of your situation uh, because you're not the one flying the plane, the pilot is. The good news is that you can, your locus of control can be influenced through training and feedback. So a couple of different things you can do is you can put people in situations where they can practice feeling in control. You can teach a bias towards action and you can give people a deeper meaning behind their actions. Basically make it something that matters to them and that will help them to feel like they can influence their destiny. Yeah, and the next chapter, Charles talks about teams. So on the screen are some very popular teams. You guys should recognize them. Ninja Turtles. Woo! Powerpuff Girls was actually on my very first birthday cake, so I'm a longtime fan. <laughs> <laughs> so all of you should know that each of these teams are very different from one another because they operate in different styles. But at the end of the day, they always got their jobs done. 
So the key question in this chapter was, what is the formula for a successful and productive team? Google was actually curious about this too, so they conducted some internal research and just tried to find some patter patterns amongst their most successful teams. And they kind of realized that there actually wasn't any particular pattern, so instead of studying the people that made up the teams, they decided to look at how the people interacted with one another. And in the end, they found out that how teams work matters more than who's on them. There were five key norms that all these successful teams shared. Number one, teams believe that their work was important. Number two, teams felt like their work was personally meaningful. Number three, teams had clear goals and defined roles. Number four, each member knew that they could depend on one another. And number five, most importantly, there was a sense of psychological safety, which is basically where members knew that they could trust each other and they could take smart risks. So when you combine all of these five key norms, you have the formula for creating a successful and productive team. Just like the marketing team at Book Talk. <laughs> we try our best. <laughs> so next we're going to talk a little bit about focus. This is actually a screenshot of my computer the other day. So I don't know if this looks familiar to you guys at all. Definitely. So <laughs> yeah, I have, you know, a bunch of different things going on. I've got my chat, I've got my email, some browser windows, an Excel document. There's just so many different things going on and so many different technologies we have access to. It can be difficult to focus. And that's kind of the challenge of this age of automation in which we currently live in. And one of the things that happens in the age of automation is automation mode. And what automation mode is, is it basically allows our brain to relax and conserve energy, subconsciously controlling our stress and making it easier for, the brain, for us to brainstorm and prepare for bigger cognitive tasks. So it's kind of like putting our brain in autopilot. Uh, I think of the movie WALL-E and the humans that are pretty much in constant <laughs> autopilot all the time because they have all these technologies to do everything for them. So uh, in a work environment, it would be, you could be in automation mode when you're working on a specific tedious, repetitive, menial task that you're just very comfortable doing. And this can be good when you need to get a lot of work done in a short period of time, but there are some negative side effects. And mainly the biggest one is cognitive tunneling. And what that is, is a mental glitch that sometimes occurs when our brains are forced to transition quickly from relaxation, relaxed automation mode to focused attention. And it can cause us to be overly focused on whatever is directly in front of us. And this kind of reminds me of when I'm driving on the freeway and I'm listening to music and I'm on cruise control and I'm just kind of driving literally in autopilot and then a car swerves directly at me. My first oh, wow. instinct when I, <laughs> when I switch out of automation mode is to swerve to the right. And that's a mental glitch because I'm not really thinking about the cars that are around me and that I might hit another car. So really, if I t took a step back and focused, I would think, okay, maybe I should brake. And so the solution to overcoming automation mode and cognitive tunneling is habitual forecasting. And what that is, is creating mental models or pictures of what you expect to see. So you can tell yourself stories of what you think will occur. So a good thing to do, for example, is when you're on your way to work, to ask yourself, what am I going to do today? And this will help you to choose what to direct your attention on throughout the day so you can make decisions rather than just react when different things come up. And actually at BookPal, what we do is in the morning, we write three things that we want to focus on that day. And it kind of helps us to stay on task and then also handle um, any sort of interruptions that, that occur. Yeah, so as Michelle said, it's really important to focus, but it's more important to actually focus on a specific goal or set of goals. Because goal setting forces us to make concrete plans and just generally helps us be more productive. So a very common goal setting process is called SMART goals. And these goals are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and based on a timeline. They need to be provably within reach and have an actionable plan. So something that Jack Walsh discovered at GE was there was actually a risk with all these SMART goals because sometimes people would choose tasks that were easy to perform and not reach for bigger goals. And this was because they wanted to check things off their list more than they wanted to aim high or dream big. So if SMART goals alone don't work, what does work? So Jack Walsh talks about something here called stretch goals. And a stretch goal is an aim that's so ambitious that you might not even know how to achieve it yet. It's a seemingly out of reach objective that can spark jumps in innovation and productivity as long as it's not too big. 
So the key to goal, goal setting here is to make sure that you have stretch goals paired with your SMART goals because SMART goals will help you break down your long-term big picture goals into a step-by-step -step plan. And we do that here at BookPal as well. So we have our stretch goal, which is basically our big ambitious revenue goal. And we actually have a goal cano where we fill in the lava as we grow in revenue. And then we combine that with our quarterly rocks, which are basically specific tasks that we need to achieve in order to hit our stretch goal. And I mean, not only is it exciting, but it also keeps us on task every day and know like what we're working towards. Yeah, I think it's been personally very helpful because we have these step-by-step -step action plans and then we can see that we're actually working to this big stretch goal. Yep. And next we're going to talk about managing others. So I don't know if you guys recognize this very famous manager from Office Space, <laughs> Phil Lumberg, but he's not exactly the best manager in the world. So if you don't want to be like him, I recommend you listen up to this section. So management style starts with company culture, which has a powerful effect on how companies evolve and how they perform. So we're going to dive into five company culture models that Duhigg writes about in the book. So first, there's the engineering model, which is your stereotypical Silicon Valley startup. Everyone comes from a similar background and mindset, and it's very group oriented rather than individual oriented. Then we have the bureaucratic model, which is very structured. There's a lot of rules job responsibilities are very clearly written out, and there's a clear hierarchy of power that's concentrated among a few high-ranking managers. And an example of this would be government institutions, universities, and the like. Then there's the STAR model, where they hire executives from elite universities and other really successful companies. And these employees have a lot of autonomy. They have fancy cafeterias, lavish perks, you know, putt-putt, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the autocratic model, which is very similar to the bureaucratic model, but all rules and decisions point to the desires and goals of one person. So think Apple from the Steve Jobs era. And then lastly, there's the commitment model, where getting culture right is the number one priority. And these types of companies value people over profits. They want lifetime employees. There's a really strong sense of trust between managers, workers, and customers. And they're just committed to everyone's success. So for us, I think we really started as an autocratic model where everybody was operating in accordance with Tony, our president's vision. But in more recent times, I think we've been moving more and more toward the commitment model where we're really working to put employees first. Uh, we're doing a lot to build company culture and work on emulating our core values throughout everything we do and then layering in rewards and incentives. So circling back to where we started on the topic of managing others, the question here is, what do successful managers do? What do successful managers from these commitment model companies do? So number one, they give workers a, sense, a strong sense of control and authority. They delegate decision making to the person closest to the problem. They insist on a culture of commitment and trust, and they're overall just dedicated to their employee's success. And when managers do all of this, it helps their employees work smarter, faster, and better. Ta-da! That's the name of the book. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Next, decision-making, chapter six. So Duhigg writes that the secret to good decision-making is forecasting the future. And the method he suggests is probabilistic thinking, which of course is used in the world of poker. And so what is probabilistic thinking? What it is, is the ability to hold multiple conflicting outcomes in your mind and estimate their relative likelihoods. So basically, you see the future as a bunch of different possibilities that contradict each other until one comes true. And this causes you to focus less on what we hope will happen and more on what is likely to occur. So he writes about this example of Annie Duke, who's a professional poker player, and how she uses probabilistic thinking to decide whether or not to bet on a particular hand. So for one hand, she maps out the different scenarios and then determines the most likely outcome. So in this case, she decides that if she plays 100 hands, she'll win 20 times. So if she wagers $1,000 for the 100 wagers, she'll profit $1,000. So she decides to bet on the hand. So it's a little bit confusing, but he does a really good job of explaining this in the book. So I'd recommend checking that out. So how can you make better decisions? First, you can train yourself to think probabilistically by envisioning various contradictory futures and deciding which one is most likely to occur. 
And then you also want to expose yourself to a wide spectrum of successes and failures, because this allows you to make more realistic assumptions on what is likely to occur, because you're not just looking at successful people, you're looking at failure, fail, people who failed and why they failed. The next chapter is all about innovation, and at the core of innovation is creativity. So creativity is kind of this intangible, hard to grasp concept, but Steve Jobs really puts it well when he says that creativity is just connecting things. So how do you and I unlock our creativity? Well, we can use personal experiences as raw materials for innovation, and that's basically connecting our personal lives with the projects that we're working on at work. Another way we can unlock our creative creativity is to mix old ideas in new ways because when we look around us, a lot of the things that are happening, a lot of the things that are created today are just revamped ideas in the past. Yeah, and he talks about the special secret uh, for creativity, which is to disturb things just enough in order to spark a new idea. And he writes about Frozen and the creators of Frozen and how they had this plot that they had mapped out and it was about a year before the movie was to be released. And they did a presentation and it just didn't resonate with anybody. Nobody was impressed. It was very dark and it just didn't have the oomph that they were looking for. And they didn't know what to do because they were in such a tight time crunch. So they ended up promoting one of the writers to be a producer of the film. And that was just the spark that they needed to, in order for her to come up with the, the right storyline that ended up becoming what is now, you know, one of the most successful major animations of our time. So, you know, what we do at BookPal, we like to do is to mix up our meeting locations in order to spark creativity a little bit. So sometimes we'll meet outside, sometimes we'll meet in the lobby, and then sometimes we'll be sitting or walking or standing and just to try and mix up our environment. Yeah, so there are actually a lot of ways you can increase the productivity of your creative process. And one of them is to embrace the creative pain that Michelle was describing with Frozen. Because they were on a time crunch, they had to make an incredible film in such a short amount of time and they really embraced that stress and created something amazing. Another thing you can do to increase the product, your productivity is to be sensitive to your own experiences. Basically what we were talking about earlier, just drawing from your own life as raw material. And it's also very important to maintain some distance from what you create to see your work from a new and different perspective. And now the last chapter is all about absorbing data and making smart decisions based off that data. And it's actually one of my favorite chapters in the book. So how many of you have ever been in the situation where you go to the grocery store and you just want some cereal, but when you get to this aisle, there's just an overwhelming number of choices? I have. So, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so this is actually called information blindness and it's our mind's tendency to stop absorbing data when there's just too much to take in. But don't get me wrong, data can be transformative. It's but it's only transformative when you know how to use it. So what's the key to overcoming this information blindness? Well, the key is to create this fluency. That means you have to, instead of just receiving information, you need to engage with it and transform it into something useful. So he, in the book, there's this example about Cincinnati public schools, and they were one of the lowest testing scoring schools in the state. And they actually had this, sophisticated software system that collected all of this data on their students, but none of the teachers were using it. So instead, the school district decided to switch things up by implementing a data room, which was actually a physical location in the school, usually in like a conference room, where the teachers had to go twice a week and write data down on note cards and then do something with it. So they would write down test scores and they would write down ages and, and all these different data about their students and then compare and identify patterns and then experiment. So by manipulating and handling that data, within two years, they were recognized by the White House as a model of inner city reform. So it obviously turned out to be a huge success for them. And what we learned from this example is just the power of using and working with data and what you can accomplish. Yeah, and we, we kind of threw a lot of data at you guys today. So to help you absorb all of this, we're going to send you a follow-up email with all the key takeaways. Yeah, so right now we're ready for the question and answer section. So if you have any questions for us, you can go ahead and send those in the chat. Just going to wait a few seconds, see them come in. Oh, here's one. So someone asked us, who are, 
oh, sorry, not who, <laughs> what are good tasks for automation mode and what are bad tasks for automation mode? Do you want to take that well, one, Elizabeth? Yeah, sure. I'll start us off. So a lot of data entry tasks or anything that's menial, menial and just very automatic, not automatic, I'm sorry, routine for you, those are usually some good tasks for automation mode. But the key, word, the key thing to remember is that any task, you should have to, you should step back once in a while to make sure that whatever you're doing, whatever tasks you're doing, whether they're automated or not, you have to make sure that it's helping you accomplish your stretch goal. Yeah. What do you think, Michelle? I would agree. I think that you have to be aware even when you're working in your day-to-day -day tasks that you're paying attention and focusing because it's easy to make mistakes, especially when you're working on something that you feel really comfortable with. Um, so we just got another question. Does Duhigg tie in any of the concepts in his book with his work on habits? Ooh, that's a very good question. Well, a lot of the examples that Duhigg uses in this book is actually stories of other people. So for example, Frozen, GE, there are stories about um, airplanes, there are stories about poker. I actually can't quite recall any of his personal stories. Michelle, can you? No, I think that he uses just examples and he uses a lot of, of um, he uses a lot of psychological studies, which I think is similar to what he does, what he wrote about in The Power of Habit. And, you know, I actually think that automation mode is, is very similar to some of the things that he talks about with habits and how people behave. And same with the choices and decision making um, when or absorbing of data. So I think that he's kind of taking habits and taking it a step further with how we can be more productive with our habits. So it's, it's kind of, I, I, I actually haven't read The Power of Habit in full, so I can't be 100% certain, but I think that it's um, kind of a good supplement to the other book. That's a really good question too. Yeah. So let's see, we got one more question. How do you determine what company culture is right for your company and is there a best company culture model? Well, the company culture model that Charles promotes in this book is the commitment model because of that sense of psychological safety that we talked about earlier where there's just a sense of trust between team members, between managers, between customers, and that's the one he really promotes. But with that being said, you really have to see what you have at your own company because it just depends on where you are as a business so far. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, he doesn't really talk about this in the book, but I think that some companies are actually a blend of a couple of different company culture models because she, there's some that, you know, not everybody fits into a perfect mold. So it's, you know, I think that ideally, you might want to aim for a certain model for whatever works best for your business. And if you can integrate some of the commitment model principles, then that's probably the best situation. Yeah, that was, I like that question. All right, so I think that's all we have time for today. But we just wanted to say thank you to everyone for attending. And if you have any questions or feedback, please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, also, we need your help spreading the word. So if you enjoyed this webinar, please tweet us a shout out using hashtag BPWebinar.